And then it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here and maybe all of those of you who watch the recording and to topic yeah. one webinar yeah. about online participation and digital literacies. And <coughs> it's um, particularly, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm very glad that uh, uh, we have a guest again uh, today for the topic, uh, again, David White, um, uh, I think for the third time. Um, Could be, yeah. yeah. Or and um, you maybe um, uh, read about the uh, about Dave, um, but just um, uh, to formally introduce you, maybe or uh, Dave is um, the head of the digital uh, of digital learning at the University of Arts in London. Um, I hope this is still correct, um, but I'm pretty sure it's still correct that you are the president of the Association uh, of Learning Technology in mm -hmm. in the UK. And for all of you that uh, don't know this, uh, the, the ALT, which is also called, is uh, the leading <coughs> body in the UK for digital learning. Um, and um, with over 3,500 members, I think, uh, very uh, organizes awesome conferences, does great community building and uh, sharing a lot of great knowledge and uh, fantastic. Fourth time, maybe, uh, uh, I, he I see in the chat. Um, um, so, um, yeah, Dave, thanks so much for being with us again. And, um, yeah, all of you probably know uh, Dave from the video, um, as he is also a great thinker about, um, digital and open online education and how, um, we can think about, uh, online participation, and digital literacies. We assume you all have seen the video and read maybe a little bit about visitors and residents, Dave. Take it Hi. away. Thank you. Now, just so that you know, I've managed to set up Zoom so I can't see the text chat, but I will, what, at, the, at the earliest possible juncture, I will rearrange everything. Uh, I, can, I can check in the uh, chat. Okay, great. Um, there's so many possible ways of, of laying these things out. So, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming along. Um, it's good to be here, where, whatever we mean by here these days, sort of everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And yeah, this session is, is, well, it's entitled Online Participation and Digital Literacies. I think the main thing to know about this session is that we'll, we, there's a couple of activities that we'll be doing um, at, uh, at a couple of points, but I will flag when they're coming up so that you uh, remember. <laughs> <laughs> I always think it's useful to flag when an activity is coming up so that people pay attention because the amount of times I've been in a session and, and all I've heard is, so, okay, you guys get on with that then. And I'm like, get on with what? I probably should be paying attention. So I will flag it. Um, because I'm screen sharing, I, I'm in the enviable position of not quite remembering what my next slide is, which is also fun as well. So we'll see how we get on. But we've got an hour, um, which is plenty of time. Let me see if I can make this move on. So these, I don't know if this is still exactly like this because I probably got this from the first time I, I ran, uh, I, I did a session within ONL. Um, and I, the reason that I put this up here is not uh, to make you ner nervous about learning outcomes and all the rest of it, but I think it's really to highlight that um, to be able to explain, discuss, and reflect on different aspects of online learning, then um, it's useful to have a kind of understanding of your own engagement with the, with the online environment. And actually that's quite a difficult thing to do holistically. It's a bit like me with my calendar. You know, we tend to go from one thing to the next, but we're, it's quite hard to get a sense of that kind of map or that picture of, of, of all the different things we're doing online and our various motivations involved in that. And I'll just say, if you do want to text chat whilst I'm talking, then please do ask questions and, and I'll, I'll pass over to York to, to um, uh, sort of pick up on that if anything comes in that's worth kind of discussing in the moment. So just to frame the session, um, this I find quite a useful quote. So this is Kevin Kelly, Kelly who is... A, a kind of um, bit of a legend in the internet world, uh, really. And, uh, and this is a quote from 1997. And I think it's fair to say that it's actually happened or is, is certainly happening. 
um, I can't remember, there's the Internet of Things, which is, you know, things that are connected, that are kind of web or Wi-Fi enabled, whether it's, you know, your washing machine or your fridge or your laptop. There are now billions and billions and billions of these things. And I think that this is the, 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 the thing that has shifted what it means to be in the world the most over the last 20 or 30 years, this, this hyper connectivity. And I think in terms of education, we're still adjusting to it in various ways. You know, the, uh, if, you're, if you're teaching in a physical room, if you remember that, then you're probably going to be showing slides on a machine, on a computer that is connected to the most hyper-connected thing in the history of everything ever with the most amount of knowledge out there. Um, you have access to just this, this unimaginable wealth of stuff and yet quite often with teaching we, we haven't figured out how to actually bring that in and deal with it without it being overwhelming so we're still getting to grips with it it's happened pretty quickly just a quick note about covid because you know it would be odd to not reference covid um from my point of view it's been and i expect from yours it's been the most this the single most intense period of staff development that we've ever had at my institution and not necessarily in a way that everybody wanted clearly not in the way but i think what's useful to do is to separate out the affordances or the opportunities of teaching and learning online from covid i think occasionally at my institution there's a feeling that the the pandemic and digital are kind of almost the same thing uh, when in actual fact, how we feel about our work at the moment, how we feel about life at the moment, some, a lot of that, you know, most of that is to do with COVID. Some of it is to do with digital. I mean, everybody's just kind of tired and everybody just wants to go back to seeing people face to face. In the UK, of course, we all want to go down the pub. If pubs are shut, then the UK is shut, right? So, so it's, it's a tricky one at the moment. But what we've been finding is when you can separate these two things out, people are actually broadly very positive about digital. It would be interesting to imagine what the pandemic would have looked like if we hadn't had the internet. It's almost unimaginable, unimaginable, isn't it? So it's interesting to reflect on that. This is a little, this is a sort of an aside. You can search for this on YouTube. I did a little five minute video called the Desituated Art School. And basically it's just a little provocation about what does it mean to run an art school or a university when you've got little or no access to buildings? And I think it's, it's forced us to ask some really interesting questions about what education is, what our jobs are, what the possibilities are for the future, you know, good and bad. And I think what's really exciting about this moment of history is that we don't really know the answers to those questions. You know, it's a very, very live discussion. Um, in the UK, things might open up. Um, soon we'll be opening up our physical campuses will students come back to the physical campuses if they do in what numbers what will they expect we don't honestly know it's kind of daunting and exciting at the same time but it's forcing us in quite a helpful way to kind of reframe education anyway enough framing so I mentioned Kevin Kelly earlier, and he ran this project called the Internet Mapping Project, which is really, it's really simple and really effective. And he did this a number of years ago. And essentially the project, you can, you can do this with students, you can do this with anybody, it's quite good fun. The project is to please draw a map of the internet as you see it and indicate your home. Okay. And everybody has a different response to this. And I think, so this is a 12 year old and he's got the kind of servers and wires and laptop sort of view. I'm looking over at my screen to the right here. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because the digital environment is an imaginary environment in some senses. You know, we've, we, we've all got our ways of conceptualizing it, but everybody's way of conceptualizing it is different. So you get another answer here, the kind of swirly, slightly messy answer, um, which is probably closer to what um, to how I think of it, I guess. And a completely different one again. And, you know, it's, 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 it's radically open to interpretation what that might mean. I see it as like information sort of going through a computer and out the other side, but it's just, it's gorgeous when you have such a simple question and people have such different interpretations. 
you know, the colleagues that you work with and the students that you work with will all have as radically different interpretations. And then this one, which is, you know, there, there's no technology in there, it's just people. So what you've got is probably the most contemporary view of, of, of what the internet is, which is it's a place where I go to connect with people. And so this view is correct. It's a collection of computers wired together. And this view is correct as well. I mean, that person, that was, they must have done this, you know, in about 2007 when the internet was a much happier place because everybody's smiley there. So, <laughs> um, and that's exactly why it's useful to um, find ways of conceptualizing the digital environment and people's perspectives on it. Because otherwise, when you talk about the digital, when you talk about the internet or the web, what it's for, what it might be useful for. Everybody's thinking of different things. Uh, in education terms, I this is quite a useful diagram. Although, as I, as I tend to say, it, it also demonstrates that educationalists love triangles. Like you, you'd be hard pressed to find an educationalist that doesn't love a triangle diagram. And the area that I tend to focus on is the top there, the identity and practices. I'm really keen on that idea of, of what education means. I mean, obviously I'm working in higher education. So I feel like higher education is a lot about becoming, it's a lot about developing your identity. It's a lot about the practices you learn. But to be clear, the skills and access awareness are fundamental to that. It's not exactly a ladder that you step through. Actually, you're constantly looping around this, but, um, Whilst I'm going to talk about identity and practices a lot, I, I want to acknowledge that skills and access are, are absolutely fundamental. And, and, you know, you know that um, you could try and run a session like this, but if you didn't have IT support or if Zoom was broken, it wasn't going to happen. Right. So it, it's it's an intriguing challenge for an institution because it involves so many different people working together. One of the upsides of COVID for me in my job is that everybody's been working together much, much more closely, actually, which has been good. So let's, I'm going to ask you to do a thing just in a second. Uh, uh, there's this idea of digital natives, digital natives, digital immigrants, um, which has been around for about 20 years. And is still an idea that a lot of people build on or respond to in the way that they approach technology and in the way that they approach teaching. But before I get into it, what I'd like to do, I don't know if you can, I can probably, yeah. can you copy and paste that into the chat for me? Yes, I will. Um, uh, th we had a few questions. Uh, uh, Go on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I put the link on there anyway. Um, so in the chat, uh, Maria, the last question here, where does knowledge came into this triangle? And um, oh, let's maybe look. before that was. Um... Yeah, I think I think it, it depends what you mean by knowledge. There's a, there's a kind of there's this constant debate about the difference between information and knowledge. I, I think my, my I'm kind of a bit of a social constructivist. And so. I believe that knowledge is sort of collectively produced. And I think the internet is the place where that can happen a lot. So I think the knowledge is, you know, from skills, well, it's all the way through, but I'd say the bottom of the triangle is about information. You know, which buttons do I need to press? How do I do this thing? Cause there's a right way to do it. And then as you go to the top of the triangle, it becomes more about knowledge. And that's as much about, producing knowledge as it is about consuming knowledge. So that knowledge becomes this kind of co-production, um, co-produced thing. If that's an answer. Yeah. Did you have anything else? No, there were uh, some comments uh, that the, the, your initial quote, I think from, was it from Kevin Kelly was so general that's, that it sounds redundant to <laughs> Yeah, I think, it, I think that's a fair critique. But I do this little exercise sometimes, which is um, to ask, it's an interesting question to ask, which is what is fundamentally specific to the internet that hasn't come before? Like what, what, what aspects of the internet are absolutely fundamental to it? And we'll have, a, you know, we'd have a discussion about that. I'd say 
one of the things that's fundamental is this hyperconnectivity. Like everybody's connected to everybody else all the time. And also lots of things are connected to each other all the time. We've never, we've never had that. And so I'd argue that this hyperconnectivity is, it, it, it is what's shaping our, the potential for us to change education. That's why I bring it up. The other thing that comes out of it is anyone can publish. Now that's massive, absolutely huge. And you know, like academic publishing still hasn't got its head around that. Um, it wasn't that long ago, you'd need to be friends with somebody with a printing press if you wanted any, not any, any of your work to be out there, to be disseminated. Now, now all of that's disintermediated. So a combination of hyperconnectivity and the fact anybody can publish. If you think about it, Wikipedia wouldn't exist unless anybody can publish. I think that that's why I bring this up because it creates those two things in tandem create a radically different environment for education to take place in. But I'd argue that a lot of education still takes place as if those two things weren't the case. Um, so what we'll do is if it's okay, let's, if everybody can find their way to that, if you put that in the chat, I'm really, I'm not used they to running They did already, chat. you would be surprised Yay. when you come I'm, in. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to um, respond to that question. What do we mean by digital native in that space? Just type out your answer, scroll it in, and I'm going to go and find that space and put it on screen. Uh, so you see, I am prepared. Wow. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you can't see what's happening. Uh, okay, so you've clearly, you're clearly enjoying the uh, that space, which is great to see. I love that stuff. I love it when things get messy like this in a good way. Um, but if you could grab a post-it note and answer the question, you know, what 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 do we mean by digital native? No wrong answers. It's not like a trick. Um, you should just be, there's so many people in there. It's quite exciting. And also like watching a swarm of wasps. Yeah, we are 76 now in the Zoom room. And um, I'm not sure if everyone found their way to the... There's a lot of people in there. Yep. And I Rick, think can it, you repeat the question? The question is, I should have written it in the room, is what do you... What do you think the term digital native means? And, you know, whether you like the idea or don't like the idea, I'd just be interested to see what, what, how people respond to that. There's a few post-it notes appearing. I think the room might be struggling. To there's also there. messages in the chat in the lower right hand side. Um, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just going to leave people for a couple of minutes to do this and I'm going to try and get the chat, um, to appear for me uh, well the the chat in in the on that screen you're sharing right now there's a yeah, chat on it. the I've board got it. I've, got well. it. I've got it yeah i dug it out yeah. yeah 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 perfect so yeah what is a digital native is a, is the best way of phrasing that. that's a neater way of phrasing it thanks for that oh, i've got the chat open i feel like i'm actually with you guys now that was interesting This, <laughs> I think, I think the room is is really struggling with this many people. Let me just see if I can. Wow. Okay, if you do struggle with the with the whiteboard, then do drop an answer into chat. I'm going to give it a couple of minutes to see, but I think the whiteboard is actually might be falling over due to popularity. I can see stuff in the chat in the whiteboard. So we've created a bit of a kind of inception moment here where we've got stuff everywhere. So some of the things that are coming in are someone who feels at home in the digital environment, someone who started to use digital media before they, where was that one? Before they got, their toys, I think it was. As, yeah, a smartphone is the first toy. I like this. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. 
somebody who's comfortable with the quickly changing technology, which is impossible. Someone raised on the internet. Oh, there's a concept. I've got a feeling that there probably are people raised on the internet now, but I've not, never thought about it like that. Someone who prefers a screen over paper. Hmm, controversial. Okay, great. What I'm going to do is sort of flip the focus back to um, back to Zoom. There are things appearing. And I don't know what it looks like on your computer, but the whiteboard's gone crazy there. So I think we found the limits of that. Friends on Facebook. More friends on Facebook than friends in real life. Okay, great. So let me um, get the slides back up to sort of anchor where we're at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are all good answers. Um, so it's Mark Prentice that came up with the idea of digital natives and immigrants. And in his original little short paper, he suggested that um, uh, a digital native was essentially somebody who'd, who'd grown up with the technology already around them. And so it's actually a metaphor, it's useful to think about it as a metaphor of language. That's, the, that's actually the most helpful way of thinking about it, which is that if you're a digital native, then you can use digital technology as like you were speaking your first language. But if you're a bit older and the technology has kind of appeared when you are an adult, then you might be brilliant with the technology, but it'll always be like you're speaking a second language. Perhaps you're slightly less fluent because it's not sort of part of your natural environment. Now, it's not a terrible idea by any means, but what it came to be um, known as was, or how it came to be interpreted was, old people are rubbish with technology. And then that came to be used as an excuse, A, for older people not to learn the technology. This is, you know, back, back 15 years ago. So A, that excuse, and B, a reason to not have to actually talk to young people about technology and how they might use it. So you get this whole generation of younger people that were never supported in their use of technology because, especially in higher education, because we did the, this, which is we a friend of mine came up with this. Um, we confused ownership with capability. And I think this is a fair way of looking at it. You know, we saw students coming onto campus and they all had better laptops and phones than we did. And we imagined that, that that meant that they were brilliant with technology. But what does that even mean to be brilliant with technology? And that's an interesting question. Um, so the fact is people are brilliant with the bit of technology or with the bit of the digital environment that means the most to them. So you have a generation of students that are perhaps very, very comfortable in Facebook, very, very comfortable in Snapchat. But that doesn't mean that they know how to research, you know, sift knowledge, um, critically evaluate sources, bring them together. You know, it, 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 these are two separate things. And I think that's, that's what got confused. We imagined that um, owning nice looking technology meant you were suddenly, suddenly really, really good with all of these kind of critical literacies. Um, so do you do you want to take a minute to hear there's some interesting comments in the yeah yeah in the chat yeah, yeah, let's do it yeah um michael uh, is writing uh, but the technology changes so knowing something well at a certain point does not guarantee you yeah. will be able to follow in the same path and so fluency like in language seems yeah. a useless concept um i don't know if michael wants to elaborate on this or um or you want to just bounce it off as it is? Well, I, I was thinking about this just this morning, this idea. I think digital fluency is a useful idea, but it is subtly different from that idea of language fluency. Although I'd argue language is always evolving, so it sort of connects. But I suddenly had this flashback to this moment back in the 90s where I showed a lecturer something that had happened on the internet, like this new thing you could do. And he just looked at me and went, how am I supposed to keep up with this? Right. And and I was like and I suddenly realized that he thought that that was the point. Whereas because I was used to because I kind of hit the Internet around about the time I was an undergraduate. 
I, I was definitely taking the, the attitude that I'd have an idea or a project or something I wanted to achieve. And then I'd just figure out the best way to do it with whatever tools or methods were available. I, I was definitely not trying to learn how to do the internet correctly, which is such a ridiculous phrase. But I think actually fundamentally that's really, really important. You know, the, the, the 30, 40 years ago, there, there were there were more of the world contained things that you that there was a correct way of doing them. And now that idea is odd. So I think fluency means your ability to be able to appropriate and use the technology and those digital spaces to achieve what you did the direction you decided to go in and what that means is that you have to have a good sense of what you're trying to do and what direction you want to go in you know outside of the technology and certainly if i ran a course which was called learn how to do the internet right i think everybody would laugh at me <laughs> although there'd be plenty of people that would hope that that was possible um yeah, and that idea, keeping up is interesting, that idea good enough to know how to handle things that are relevant in your field, even though it changes quickly. I think that's also really important is, is the idea that perhaps that sense that mastery isn't, isn't what it used to be. And that really it's a question of whether you have the fluency and broad capability or literacies to be able to um, achieve what you've set out to do, but you might not be an expert or a master in any particular area. Um, yeah, exactly. So we're in this sort of hyper explosion of knowledge and ways of doing things. Now, what's interesting to consider in that is if I think about the pandemic, a lot of what we did was try and replicate the way the face-to-face -face university worked, but in the digital because despite the fact that the digital gives us the opportunity to do things in many different ways, the truth is we tend to replicate previous models and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it can be a frustrating and disappointing thing. And so when I hear of people getting frustrated with say online teaching, more often than not, it's because they are trying to mirror a face-to-face -face paradigm online rather than modify the, the way that they work. So a really good example of the difference here is I really like being able to see the chat because I like it when people talk while I'm talking because it feels like more connected. Clearly, that's quite a radical departure from a normal lecture face-to-face. -face. It just, just wouldn't work, right? And I've been in situations where I've asked people to chat while I'm talking and they just think it's rude. They think it's actually you know, against the etiquette of a teaching moment. And so it's a bit of a culture shift. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move on, otherwise we won't get to the next bit, And but I will come back to chat. So I had a long argument with Mark Prensky who came up with Digital Natives and Immigrants at a conference a couple of years ago. And it was, uh, if I'm honest, it was so frustrating. I had to leave and go to the airport immediately afterwards. <laughs> You can probably see I'm frustrated just in that picture there. But it was it was interesting. It was fine. What actually happened was that Mark characterized the university sector in a way that I didn't recognize and then critiqued it on that basis. And my response was kind of like, yeah, but it's not actually like that at all, is it? So it wasn't a very useful debate from that point of view. But anyway, I, I'm not, you know, the native and immigrants idea it's just something to be careful with. It was useful at the time, but it can be misused. I'm gonna skip over that. So what we're gonna do now is a mapping exercise, the visitor and residence mapping exercise, which is a kind of response to the native and immigrants idea. And it's about motivation to engage online. And I'm gonna very briefly describe this, the visitor and residence paradigm, which was a kind of response to the native and immig immigrants one. And you can decide whether you think it's useful or not and then we'll do the mapping. So it's been used everywhere. This is my little slide that I need to update that just proves that it's an actual thing. So there's just a little bit of me trying to be credible there. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, it's a continuum and I'm just gonna explain either end of it so that you know the idea that we're working with. And then I'm gonna hand it over to you to kind of use, okay? So if you've got a bit of paper and pen handy, 
now that would be that would be useful so rather than based on age this is based on motivation to engage and this is what i found when i was developing the idea was that people didn't seem and this is back in 2007 2008 is that people didn't um pe people's ability to use the technology wasn't based on how technologically skilled they were it was based on how motivated they were to engage with it so my, my a kind of classic example of that was um you know if grandchildren move from the UK to Australia, then the grandparents suddenly learned how to use Skype without too much trouble, right? Over COVID, you can see a myriad of examples of this. And it's not because they suddenly got interested in the internet, it's because there was like a reason for them to use it, right? So this is about motivation to engage. So if I, it's a continuum, it's a sliding scale. So we're not trying to put people in two boxes. And if I briefly, describe either end of the continuum, then it's a good way into it, okay? So at the visitor end of the continuum, you see the web like, a, you're almost thinking of the web like a series of tools. You're not really thinking about it explicitly, but we, if you can imagine it like an untidy toolbox. You, pro, you might have seen the video, so I'll go through this quickly. You decide what you wanna do, you find the tool, you do it and you close the lid. Now, back in the day, I'd have said, you log off. Now, nobody logs off, right? All that happens now is you just stop looking at the screen. <laughs> so it's not about whether you're online or not. You're online the whole time. It's just, are you looking at the screen? The important thing is it doesn't leave a social trace. Again, what's been interesting in recent years is that people are much more mindful of the fact that it does leave a data trace, but it doesn't leave any visible social trace to other people on the web. Do you see what I mean? So there's some examples there of visitor mode. In resident mode, and this came from the idea that actually people do live out a portion of their lives online. And during COVID, it, do I need to say that? I mean, like 90% of life is happening online. So, you know, when I came up with this idea, that was still seen as quite a radical thought that part of life happened online and it was as real as real life, if you like. And here you're thinking of the web as like a series of spaces or places rather than as a set of tools. And your motivation for going online is to connect with other people. So you will leave a social trace and it's to be kind of co-present with people, either synchronously or asynchronously. So Zoom is a very resident space, but I'd argue that, you know, Twitter is just as resident in different ways. A lot of social media works on that basis. And it requires you to have some kind of digital identity because whatever you're contributing has to be connected to you as a person, otherwise it's not social. Could be an alternative identity. Um, and there you can see some examples there. Now in the middle, and this is really important of that continuum, is a lot of activity. It's exactly what we're doing here right now, which is it's kind of resident, but it's sort of got an edge to it. Like we know that there's 70 something people in here and we know they're all doing the same course. Awful lot of what goes on online is in those kind of categories and especially in education. So then what we did was we added this vertical axis because context is really, really important. And because we act, obviously our motivation to engage in a personal context is different from institutional. Again, during COVID, this is starting to collapse and you know it gets a bit confusing. And then what that allows you to do is to create a map of your engagement online. So that's just an example map from me. And my map's always shifting around. So it's never quite right when I look at it, but I'm gonna explain it very, very quickly. And then I'm gonna hand over to you to start sketching your own maps, okay? So yeah, exactly. You can use Twitter in visitor mode too. And any resident space, you can, any successful resident space, you tend to be able to be in visitor mode. So like I call it elegant lurking. So it's, it, it's, you know, if, if you're in here and you've not got your camera or your microphone on, then you're more in visitor mode than if you've got your camera on where you're a bit more resident. <laughs> so it's really, it, it's interesting how it plays out, right? For me, Twitter's super resident. So you can ask the question, where would you go online to find Dave White? And the answer is Twitter, okay? Mainly posting about work, 
Um, so it kind of stretches that way. I blog, but I blog in a professional capacity, but I'm happy to talk about that. I leave the comments on. So that's, that's why that's sort of institutional resonance. Skype, that's actually changed. And it, I quite like the way that this is out of date because it sort of reminds me that it's changed. I, in my previous job, I used to just have Skype on all the time and people could just connect with me and have a chat because I was very much networked. I was working on a lot of national things across lots of different institutions, so that made sense. If I go to the other side of the map, for me, email, personal, is just very administrative. So I just visit it to organize things. I'm not really present socially in email. Whereas I'm probably more present socially in email for work, as you can see down the bottom there, and so on and so forth. Some things end up in the middle. Okay. Now you might have you might have seen the video, so I might be over egging this. What I'd like to do now is to invite you, and if you can grab that and chuck it into the chat so that I don't get um, confused by various levels of reality here. Um, then what I'd like to invite you to do, and I think what I'll do is I'll leave this up on screen. Grab a pen and paper or a digital means, draw the axis and then have a go at making your own map. You can be, it can be as rough as you like. Nobody ever kind of captures everything first go. It's a messy process. The problem with me showing you that one is it looks far too neat, actually. Most maps are really messy and that's how that's sort of how it should be. So if I there's the link to the Padlet, I'm just going to give pe people sort of a um, few minutes, have a go at creating your map. And then the easiest thing to do is to um, take a take a picture with a mobile phone and drop it into the Padlet that way. So actually what I'm going to do is because you might then have to type it in, I'm just going to make a shorter version of the Padlet um, URL right now, but I'll leave you to, to do that. Um, and I think what I'll do is, you probably don't want to watch me doing that. So I'll do it on a different screen. <laughs> Otherwise I can make a bitly if you want to. Or... Oh, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. We'll make a bitly for people if you have to type it out, but yeah. And in a couple of minutes, I'll switch over to the Padlet view and we'll see what we've got and we can have a bit of a chat. <coughs> this is something that um, you can do with the staff development. It's something you can do with students. It's a great way of starting a conversation around just the digital environment generally, really. Any questions, drop them into chat and I'll, I'll deal with them as we go. So, Mari, we are drawing this quadrant that you can see on screen, I hope, and then making a ver your version of a visitor and resident map. So think about how you engage online and where and start drawing those squares and, and labeling them up. So you might spend tons of time in your institutional VLE. You might spend tons of time in a particular bit of social media you might spend most of your time just in email. Great. And here is a type friendly link for the forms. I'll just switch to, uh, switch to the Padlet. Oh, there's, there's a couple of maps. And if you want to, maybe, uh, Dave, if you click on the share button, maybe the you could maybe create a, it allows you to do, um, uh, if you click on share in the top right bottom uh, corner, 
top oh, yeah. right share maybe you can get the embed code and uh, 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 sorry a qr code oh Ooh. <laughs> so you could point your phone at that as well uh, it works very well with iphones for some android phones you need a qr code reader well i'll leave that up there for a little bit while people have a go and Let's then see if it works Yeah. Oh, I managed to shut down chat again. Chat's quiet, so I'm going to imagine that people are happy. I think so. Nina, um, it's, uh, okay. Just have a look. Sorry, I'll put that back up. You should be. What does it say, Nina? Um, because um, it looks okay to me, and I'm not logged in. No. There's a few maps arising. Arri arriving <laughs> both i guess <laughs> that's a, that's the first time i've ever received a non-visual visitor residence map okay here's some coming in lovely they're starting to appear oh is it in excel there i don't know i'm having trouble keeping up that's just that's a picture of a monument <laughs> Which, which is good. Yeah. Okay, great. It's nice to see these coming in. I mean, just as a side point, the reason I love things like Padlet and Miro and Mural and stuff like that is that it makes, you can, it makes everybody's work visible to each other and you suddenly feel more co-present. Like much more, I feel like the presence of other people more by looking at the maps appearing than I do by looking at people's faces on webcams. Yeah, I yeah, I agree. Like this, this, we'll keep doing this for a few for a few minutes. Yeah. Now, how did somebody manage to do that so quickly? <laughs> Somebody's got a lot of stationery to hand. I like that. Very nice. Yeah, and you can move them around as well. Yeah. The other, the other thing that I that I am a fan of in terms of the sort of analog pen and paper thing is that you can immediately kind of sense the character of people through the way them, you know, like you see everybody's different. Yeah. Whereas I think that one of the downsides of the pure digital environment is it kind of irons out. The, the idiosyncrasies, the kind of things that are unique to individuals. True. Um, right. <laughs> are there some great maps coming in? Yeah, and here's somebody who's very efficient as well. I mean, it's too tiny to look at, but the fact that they 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 realised that the quickest thing to do was to screen grab. <laughs> my quadrant and then draw over the top of it true that's this pretty is, neat this is uh look at this that... oh wow <laughs> that's impressive if it has been done on the go <gasps> okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to just bring some of these up and then just maybe ask people to speak to them just for a couple of minutes and do carry on um, I'm not sure you can upload to the chat. It's it's easier to do it in the Padlet, but what you can see, you can see a lot of things coming in here. I'm a bit sport for choice. Um, I think what I'm going to do is go for a one that ha just happens to. Right. 
Let's have a look at this one. So this one's sideways. They quite often come in sideways. So then I can watch everybody on their webcams doing this, which is quite good fun. So um, whose is this? And if you feel brave, please get on the microphone. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's mine. Hello. Hi. So it looks to me like your most resident in Microsoft Teams. Is that a work-related thing? Yes, it's uh, mostly work. I think that should be a little bit lower on institutional scale, yeah. but I think somehow it's, it's there. Yeah. And then, but with Zoom, you're quite visitory. Why is that? Is that just for very particular meetings that you keep yes, quiet in? <laughs> my institutions that uh, mostly use Teams for internal ones, and it's with the externals, it's mostly Zooms, and I am in and out there. So, yeah. And so what, you've, what, what you can see there, I think that's a really nice example of the fact that Teams and Zoom have some equivalent kind of functionality in many ways. Mm -hmm. But your relationship with them, you know, the actual things that you do in them is in different positions on your maps. So I exactly. think what this brings out is the, the functionality of the technology doesn't necessarily mandate the mode of engagement, if I could put it that way. And then you've got, and then you're in Facebook, you, you're in a few, you're in Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, personally. And I guess institutional pages is kind of just like one of those sort of pages that's your biography and your work that's quite static down there, is it? Yeah, I think it's more like uh, our Moodle and all those uh, teaching learning platforms that we use. So, okay, yeah, and and what happened? What what I've seen over time is that things like institutional virtual learning environments used to always be in the visitor side, and they and they've crept over a bit more to the resident side as people have kind of shifted the way they teach online. So it just depends how you teach and what you use them for. Do you use them just um, as a kind of repository of content or is it a space where you're kind of actually connecting with people yeah, so and you can do either nowadays it's mostly uh, mostly as a repository or like it used to be but now i can also feel like i think it's slowly shifting towards a <laughs> resident mode yeah so, so i think in incoming months i'm sure it will cross that line <laughs> the, the word yeah yes yeah Thanks for that. That's great. And, and yeah, things do have a direction of travel sometimes. I'm just going to do one more. I mean, obviously, this is here and people can keep uploading them. I think I'm going to have to do this one because now. <laughs> so whose is this? This would be mine. Hi, I'm Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Um, now, you've got the blog down in the institutional resident. Is that is that the blog that you've started as part of ONL? <laughs> Exactly. So it's yeah. empty. <laughs> <laughs> so that, it's like a potential thing in some ways, but it's, it's definitely exactly. in the right. Yeah. That, that's Korean for hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that. I like an aspirational map. And you've got you've put an arrow on Twitter there. So do you feel like you're 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 saying more things in Twitter, getting involved in more things? Exactly. I reactivated my Twitter account and uh, this afternoon in our tweet chat, this is going to be the time that I want to start participating again. So there's a development. Yeah. So by the end of yeah. the course, it's more on the resident side. Yeah. And then Facebook up in the top left tends to mean that you sort of keep up with what people are doing, but you don't say much and don't post much. Is that right? Or... Exactly. Like once a year, I look into Facebook to stay connected with all my Canadian friends. That's the only reason I'm still on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. That was super clear and neat. <laughs> it's lovely. Okay. Yeah, I have to. Um, it's not finished yet, but uh, yeah, I wanted to yeah. I mean, what, what happens is sometimes I do this as part of a three hour workshop and, and it, 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 in a physical room. And you can, as, as I'm chatting through people's maps, you can see people all around the room going, oh yeah, I haven't put this in and blah, blah, blah. The one that people don't, there's two things that people, well, there's three things, but the two things that people generally don't put in are um, using Google for search, because we don't think about it because we're so normalized to it. And the other one is just like Netflix or Amazon Prime, which we've sort of forgotten is the internet. 
which is actually a huge block of visitoriness. But then you start then you start feeling weird because you realize that actually like everything's the internet and it starts to feel weird. This is excellent. We've got a whole sort of field of maps here that you can take a look at. And um, you know, that's going to be useful to come back to. What I'm going to do is and do keep asking questions in the text chat. Um, that was the discussion, by the way. Look at that planned. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna just quickly run through some ideas that come off the back of that. I'm going to do this fast because we've got like nine minutes. So we'll see how we get on. I think what's interesting for me is how if I think about, say, a traditional educational institution it tends to be fairly hierarchical, but the web is networked connections between all things, right? And I think what I tend to find is that there's this tension between networked ways of knowing and network ways of doing and hierarchical ways or taxonomic ways of knowing and doing. And really one isn't better than the other. You're trying to find a kind of sweet spot between the two. But I find this a useful lens to hold up situations. Whenever something controversial, contentious happens at my university, it's usually a fight between hierarchical and networked ways of thinking or looking at stuff. And I think we find ourselves sort of in there all the time, you know, now. And you could argue in theory terms, and I'm not going to go into these theories that, you know, hierarchical is this, this sort of constructivism and networked is kind of connectivism and networked tends to have this sort of knowledge is socially or, or, or communally produced idea, whereas constructivism is going to be more like you're, you're discovering a fixed truth and different disciplines have different positions on this and different people teach in different ways. It's not, uh, there's not, there's no value judgment here. It's just ways of seeing things. Uh, I'll skip through that for a moment. So here's some other maps. The first time I ever ran this exercise, I, I took the maps and had a quick look at them. And I realized that Facebook, which is highlighted, was in very different places. And this is my point that you're know, asking somebody if they're on Facebook, which is like an old person thing now, but asking them if they're on Instagram doesn't necessarily tell you about their mode of engagement. So you need to ask about how they're using these platforms, not just whether they have, are part of it, right? Um, this is the emptiest map I ever got. And that came with a note saying, actually, I think like social media is just trying to sell me stuff all the time. Most of the web is, so I keep out of it. This was a PhD student. And a really important point is this student may be brilliant, right? Having a busy map doesn't mean that you're necessarily the best student in the world. It just means there's a lot going on. So there's no real relationship between the shape of somebody's map and um, how successful they are. Uh, you get maps that are kind of on the visitor side. You get maps. This is interesting. If you look on Twitter, this, this person has two different profiles on the same platform, a personal one and a professional one. So that's a way of managing your relationship. Some people are like a sing, like see themselves as a single identity that, that kind of projects in different directions, but they're, they're just like one unified identity. And some people much prefer to say, well, this is professional Dave and this is personal Dave. And again, there's no correct way of doing it. It's just interesting to reflect on because I'd say the point really is not is not that there's a correct way, but that you feel like you have some agency or some control over the decisions you made in terms of how you engage. We all feel a bit weird when we feel like we've been pushed around by the digital environment and certainly our students do. I'm gonna flick through some of these very quickly. SharePoint, sad face. Um, Here's somebody's using two different colors because one of them is to do with a, a, a kind of club that they run and the other one's to do with work. So you see they've got these overlaying identities. This person had five different identities. And then you get these kind of sort of fun kind of, you know, creative approaches. It can be quite a fun sort of, you know, I quite like this one, everything bleeding into each other. So one of the things very quickly I used I, that works on an individual basis. I have done work in the past where I collected up almost 400 maps and there's a paper out there on this and then kind of analyzed which quadrants were, were filled and then mapped all of that. And I think the important thing there 
to look at in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a block called age. And what you can see is the, the, the age slice of people that had a fully filled in map was completely even across the age ranges, which kind of, to me, refuted the digital natives idea because it just depended who you are and what you were trying to achieve. And then people add to the maps, they add notes, they add different colors. So this is on a consumer creator basis. You know, you could pick up this process and kind of appropriate it to emphasize whatever you think is most important. Um, arrows, um, arrows linking things. I think that's quite useful. You know how different areas of the map interrelate. So my Twitter would feed into my blog because if I write a tweet and everybody's and it starts a massive discussion, I'll tend to write a blog post about it. Combination of both. And then that's why I like an aspirational map. That pink area there on this map is actually just aspirational. It doesn't exist yet. It's an area of the map that they want to be more active in. So it can be useful sort of for planning or deciding what direction you're heading in. And then just a couple of things at my institution, we came up with this digital creative attributes framework, which is a sort of a way of expressing the list of a list of kind of practices and attributes that we think that students, well, we know that students want to develop so that they can operate across that kind of visitor resident spectrum. We know that our students want to learn the subject area they're in, but they also want to learn how to be digitally fluent in various ways. And I, I think a lot of our students understand that what's happened over COVID has been really, really frustrating and distressing, but also they developed a whole load of capabilities in the digital environment that are gonna serve them really, really well. And then lastly, this is something that I wrote April last year as a kind of response, a really practical response to COVID. And I, I think this is really important. If you think about that range of modes of engagement in the UK, and this is shifting now, I'm glad to say, but in the UK, a lot of our higher education courses are based around this concept of contact hours. And when you boil it down, a contact hour is when you're in a room and somebody's talking at you give or take right so then that becomes that becomes the sort of core description of what we mean by teaching and I think it just doesn't work very well online and actually I'm, I'm trying to make a case for the idea of presence you know to what extent I think what students are interested in is that the presence of their tutors or the academics in various different forms what the digital environment allows us to do is work in different modes of presence right it doesn't just have to be like i'm doing now with you you know like the maps were an interesting form of presence and i think that's that's an important area so you know if if your students imagine that the only thing that counts as teaching is when they're being talked at then there's, there's only so far you're going to get in any environment and, I, and the reason that I wrote this, because I felt like the, the UK system for modeling courses really, really stuck us in that corner, you know, it was difficult to get out of. So just a final thought that, that kind of mirrors back to that Kevin Kelly approach. I love this is so positive. Now that knowledge and networks are abundant, not scarce, the emphasis should be on connection. So teachers are the arbiter of connections. I think if you're going to make the most of online of the online environment, this is a very good thing to take into the online environment. Everything's kind of there. We just have to facilitate people making the connections. We are not kind of gatekeeping knowledge anymore, as we know. Um, and that's it. Yes, on time. <laughs> Thanks Thank a million, Dave. Uh, okay. That was awesome again. And uh, I stopped the recording here.